Happy Charter Day, William and Mary. Please be seated. To everyone who's here in Kaplan Arena and to everyone who's joining us online out in the ether, welcome. We're so pleased you're here to celebrate with us today. This is the year of the arts. I was just speaking with one of our wonderful honorary degree recipients earlier. He asked me, why do I love Charter Day? And I said, because we reinvent our traditions in this day. And what you're going to see with our wonderful new video screens, what you're going to see in the student performances that we hear, and many other aspects of this day today is reinvention of amazing traditions. We're celebrating many different types of creativity today. We've already just seen and heard one amazing example. William & Mary's talented videography team created our opening video. They're here in the room somewhere. Let's just give them a whoop. Whoop, Lisa! And the poem that you heard, the poem it featured, was written by alumnus and current staff member, Jacob Miller. Jacob, are you here? Yes? <laughs> well done. So throughout this program, we are going to spotlight so many ways that the arts build community here at William & Mary. There are many, many reasons that we celebrate today, but we're going to begin, as we always do, with a new tradition, which is a reading of the university's land acknowledgement. And I am pleased to welcome Dakota Kinsel and Matthew Solomon, President and Vice President of the American Indian Association, to come do that. Madam President. William & Mary acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the land our campus is on today. The Chiranhaka Nodaway. Chickahominy. Eastern Chickahominy. Mattapanai. Monacan. Nansmund. Nodaway. Pamunkey. Padawamak. Upper Mattapanai. And Rappahannock tribes. And pay our respects to tribal members, past and present. Thank you so much. We are joined by many distinguished guests and honorees today, so please stand as you are able when I recognize you. Rector Charles Poston and William & Mary's Board of Visitors, thank you for being here. Stand when you're able. Stand when you're able. Thank you. All military personnel and veterans in this arena, please stand and let us thank you for your service. Public officials, thank you for being here. Out in the arena. <laughs> Charter Day is a time that we celebrate William & Mary's people, as you're starting to hear, if this is a new celebration for you. We're a community that knows the importance of taking the time to pause and gather in person to honor everyone who makes this place extraordinary. And we're so glad that we can start a new tradition this year of formally welcoming the newest members of our community. Spring 2024 transfer and first year students, will you please stand as you're able and receive our welcome. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> we're so glad you are here. Please be seated. We also recognize several award recipients you can read more about their accomplishments in your program. I'll begin with the Alumni Association's highest honor, the Alumni Medallion. It'll be presented tomorrow morning. And the recipients are Pam Penny and former rector Todd Stottlemyre. Would you please stand? Earlier this week, we celebrated the Jefferson Awards and the Monroe Prize in Civic Leadership. 
Here as well are those we recognize, Professor Linda Schaffner, Professor Claire McKinney, Robbie Gordy, Jaden Speedy. Would you please stand? Now every year we recognize tribal leaders who join in teaching and research partnerships with William and Mary. Distinguished leaders, please stand as you're able when I call your name. Chief Walt Redhawk Brown and Thomas G. Hines, Jr., Class of 77, Council Chief Man, Star Watcher, Dishu Wakehi, Charon Hakanadawe Indian Tribe of Southampton County, Virginia. There you are. Thank you, Chief. Reginald Stewart, Second Assistant Chief and Class of 1986, and Vanessa Y. Adkins, Class of 19, Secretary and Councilwoman, Chickahominy Indian Tribe. <laughs> Joe Spotted Eagle Howard, Tribal Council Member and Acting Assistant Chief, Chickahominy Indian Tribe, Eastern Division. Welcome. <laughs> Assistant Chief Dave Henneman, Nansaman Indian Tribe. <laughs> Chief Lynette Alston and Tribal Council Chair Denise Walters, Nottaway Indian Tribe of Virginia. Brad Hatch, Tribal Councilman, MA Class of 2009, and Jack Hatch, Class of 22, Potawatomi Indian Tribe of Virginia. There you are. And Chief W. Frank Adams and Lou Ratchford, Assistant Chief, Upper Mattapanai Indian Tribe. There you are. Thank you. We are honored to have you and your families join us, and we thank you for your continued partnership. I now invite Dr. Hatch to bring greetings. Chama, Cheska May. Greetings, all friends. It's my honor to welcome everyone assembled here to this year's Charter Day ceremony as both a citizen and council member of Potomac Indian Tribe and as a William & Mary alumnus. At last year's Charter Day ceremony, we gathered to formally commemorate the construction of the Brafferton Indian School building and reflect on the school's history and legacy. Chief Lynette Alston of the Nottaway Indian Tribe called for the building of relationships, quote, on the foundation of shared history and mutual respect for all time coming, end quote. Now we close the Brafferton commemorative year and turn our attention to the ongoing work of discovery, creation, and collaboration as it's represented by the theme of this year's ceremony, the Year of the Arts. In addition to the theme of the arts, today the tribal delegation had the opportunity to discuss important collaborative work that is being conducted in relation to water and environmental resilience. These two topics, art and environment, are indelibly linked with Virginia's indigenous communities. Many of the artistic works created by Virginia Indians today and by our ancestors draw upon our connections with the water, our natural environment, and reflect our sustainable management of natural resources. Some examples of that art include Pamunkey pottery, Monacan honeysuckle baskets, Rappahannock split oak baskets, Nottaway quilts, and Potomac eel pots. Importantly, these works clearly reflect our ability to adapt to changing natural, cultural, and economic environments and to survive. Collaboration with indigenous communities on these issues of resilience and environment has been a long time coming. But it's encouraging that institutions such as William & Mary are at last drawing on the over 15,000 years of experience indigenous peoples have with adaptation. As we rise to meet these challenges with a spirit of cooperation and greater understanding, we look to the tenacity of our ancestors in the face of the great changes, and we know that we can make the world better for our descendants. 
Here we stand and here we shall remain. Kina, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hatch. William & Mary is pleased to welcome friends and partners from the Draper's Company of London. The company was founded in the 14th century. Today, they support philanthropy and education. William & Mary's partnership with the Draper's Company is long-standing and strong. They are our frequent guests and have generously funded student scholarships and gifted artwork. We're honored that they've traveled from London for the Year of the Arts. Tom Harris, Richard Winstonley, and Andrew Ford, would you please stand? <laughs> Mr. Harris will now bring greetings. Chancellor, Rector, President, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to begin by thanking you on behalf of myself, our junior warden, and our clerk for the kind invitation and warm welcome. We've been looking forward to our visit to William and Mary with great anticipation. So you're probably wondering why somebody wearing a very heavy gown and a silly medieval hat is standing in front of you today. I am the current master of the Draper's Company, which was founded in 1364 in the city of London to control the price and quality of cloth, then England's greatest export. Rather like an early trade union, we also controlled the appointment of apprentices and looked after those Drapers who fell on hard times. Over the years, we have developed into a modern charitable body with a particular interest in education, social welfare, and prisoner rehabilitation. And in the 1880s, we provided the capital to build what is now the College of Queen Mary, University of London. We provide governors to over 18 colleges and schools and donate scholarships to over 12 other educational establishments. Two thirds of our philanthropic giving is in the field of education. But we are also a fellowship, and we have a rather special hall in London, which we purchased from Henry VIII in 1543, after he had confiscated it from Thomas Cromwell, his former chancellor. Beware of the powerful chancellor. And it was at our hall in London where links between ourselves and William and Mary first started. In 1955, the trustees of Colonial Williamsburg, including John D. Rockefeller, organized a modest seven-course dinner at Draper's Hall in honor of Sir Winston Churchill, where they presented Sir Winston, cigar in mouth, with a commemorative bell. And we suspect that the president of William and Mary and the master Draper got on rather well that night, as the first scholarship program for law students followed shortly thereafter. And that scholarship program still exists today, nearly 70 years later, and is now enhanced by exchange programs between VIMS and Bangor University in Wales, together with the Tim Sullivan Scholarship. And I've had the honor of meeting several of your recent scholarship winners and they are universally very impressive. It's also good to see the name of another famous Englishman, Sir Christopher Wren, associated with your campus. Following the Great Fire of London in 1966, which burnt out most of the city, Christopher Wren was tasked with overseeing the rebuilding of London, including our own church. Sadly, we have no evidence that he was involved in the building of our hall, but I do feel the same atmosphere when I walk into your Wren building as I do when walking into our hall. So, as Drapers, we are very proud of the ties between our two ancient institutions, and we look forward to adding to the list of scholars who have benefited from our exchange programs. 
Chancellor, Rector and President, I thank you again for your kind invitation and warm welcome. We very much hope that our historic links will continue to flourish. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. William and Mary's Chancellor, the Honorable Robert M. Gates, served as Secretary of Defense, as Director of the CIA, and as President of Texas A&M University. He has served under eight U.S. Presidents and is the only Secretary of Defense to have served under Presidents from different political parties. Chancellor Gates exemplifies the highest ideals of public service to sustain our democracy in the 21st century. Please welcome the Honorable Robert M. Gates. Thank you, Catherine. Your leadership of William and Mary continues to move us in ambitious new directions while maintaining our values through increasingly tumultuous times, both at home and abroad. We are most fortunate to have you at the helm as William and Mary's 28th president. Director Poston and the Board of Visitors, thank you for your continued service to William and Mary and your partnership with President Rowe. Under your stewardship, this university will continue its pursuit of excellence and remain the alma mater of the nation. To our honorary degree recipients, Secretary Bunch and former Director Trammell, congratulations. Recognition of your admirable achievements, leadership, and patriotism is well deserved. To our visiting tribal dignitaries, our colleagues from Draper's Company, Thank you for your partnership in broadening knowledge through learning and impactful scholarship. Broadening experiences for students today are often undervalued, not because they are insignificant, but because they are often difficult. They force us to think from new perspectives, to grapple with contradictions, and explore unfamiliar and sometimes unwelcome ideas. These experiences and the knowledge, understanding, and empathy they bring perpetuate our community and are key to achieving our mission at William & Mary. Core to the William & Mary experience is the drive to know and to change the world. We recognize our incredible opportunity to serve and to make better the lives of others. We demand liberty for all, opportunity, fairness, and justice for all. This is quintessentially American. Our forefathers, leaders from William and Mary prominent among them, forged a new nation and articulated our aspirations through years of difficult debate and painful, challenging compromises in countless homes, town halls, and finally, in stifling summertime meetings in Philadelphia. They understood that to make the world better requires first that we know the world and know ourselves and know each other. For us today to act, we too must diligently engage in the tough and broadening free flow of ideas and open discussion. We must still our own passions in order to listen, especially to those with whom we disagree. We challenge ideas, not persons. Hannah Holborn Gray, President Emerita of the University of Chicago, once wrote, education should not be intended to make people comfortable. It is meant to make them think. Universities should be expected to provide the conditions within which hard thought and therefore strong disagreement, independent judgment, and the questioning of stubborn assumptions can flourish in an environment of the greatest freedom. Sustaining William and Mary's ideals and ensuring its future success depend on the open exchange of ideas, tolerance of different points of view, the willingness to listen and to learn, and the determination of all to defend the freedom of expression of diverse opinions. 
to seek wisdom in mutual respect and wherever possible in bridging differences. These principles ground the William and Mary community in belonging, respect, and mutual care. They also comprise the pillars of our democratic society, enabling us to rise above the all too common coarseness and closed mindedness that often characterize our public discourse. Ceaseless striving to know the world and to make it a better place for each other constitutes the essence of the William and Mary experience. I have no doubt that today's scholars and graduates of William and Mary have a special role in the American quest as we have since our founders walked this same campus. We have an obligation to embrace that quest as an opportunity as well as a responsibility. That is the challenge that is before us, one for which William and Mary has been preparing its students for 331 years. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Gates. We now move to the conferral of honorary degrees. Please welcome Rector Charles Poston. Thank you, President Rowe. On behalf of the Board of Visitors, I wish to wish, I wish, to wish all of you a happy Charter Day. William and Mary's tradition of conferring honorary degrees dates back to 1756, when Benjamin Franklin became the first recipient of an honorary degree from William and Mary. This year, the Board of Visitors voted to confer honorary degrees to two celebrated leaders, former Rector Jeff Trammell and Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Lonnie Bunch. We have prepared videos highlighting their achievements. After each video, Chancellor Gates and I will confer the honorary degree. After the honorary degree conferrals, we will hear remarks from Secretary Bunch. The inimitable Jeff Trammell has been a multifaceted fellow, an athlete, a lawyer, an expert in the workings of government, a very significant servant leader, a determinant and an effective advocate for gay rights, a brave, openly gay man himself, a deeply committed member of the tribe, and a person of pervasive kindness and good cheer. Jeff has been an active member of the tribe since his graduation. He served on the board of the Thomas Jefferson Public Policy Program and served two terms on the William & Mary Board of Visitors, including two years as rector of the university. The reality is that William & Mary is so special and what it does as a preeminent, highly ranked undergraduate liberal arts university means that you are changing the lives of people when you have a chance to serve in a leadership position. Jeff had a great run as rector, including leading the development of the William and Mary Promise, a multi-pronged initiative to put more resources into teaching and research and ensure that a William and Mary education is affordable for all Virginians. He became rector at a time when William and Mary was working very, very hard to give substance to its mantra of many years standing that those who come to William and Mary belong. I've been really privileged when I realized I was gay and I came out and then was able to not let that be an impediment to pursuing professional achievements and I realized that that's important because those of us who are given the opportunity to be in those positions can help those who are struggling and I found that when I was elected rector, there were people who sent me notes and communications saying, you don't know me, but I want you to know that this encourages me. I'm proud of that. And I try to do whatever I can to help others who are, are LGBTQ find a way to pursue their full potential. Jeff's legacy is one of success on so many fronts. 
and more importantly, a life of real significance and impact on his profession, public policy, and the university he loves, William & Mary. To receive an honorary degree from William & Mary is really humbling because I hold the institution in such high esteem, because I know what it did for me and what it's done for tens if not hundreds of thousands of others. I treasure this honorary degree in a way that I could not be with, with anything else I could do in life. Mr. Trammell, would you join the Chancellor and me at the podium? Jeffrey Bevis Trammell, an alumnus and former rector of William & Mary, you exemplify the best of this university. You have dedicated your life to bettering opportunities for your fellow citizens. You've worked for years on Capitol Hill before joining Hill and Knowlton, and then founding Trammell & Company. Your expertise has been widely sought by Fortune 500 companies. You have advised six presidential campaigns and served on national boards, including the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. You were appointed to the William & Mary Board of Visitors in 2005 and reappointed in 2009. In 2011, you were elected rector, becoming the country's first openly gay board chair at a major university. In 2022, you helped create the Archive of American LGBTQ Political and Legal History at William & Mary to tell a fuller account of U.S. history. Jeffrey Bevis Travel, for your leadership and service, Alma Mater proudly honors you now and for all times coming. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Visitors and the ancient royal charter of the College of William and Mary in Virginia, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Public Service Honoris Causa. How would I describe Lonnie Bunch? Um, infinitely curious, extremely gracious, someone who is deeply conscientious, sees the world for what it is and still can be infinitely optimistic about it. I think he is able to talk about this country, what it means to be an American, how complex it is, in a way that I think no one else in this country is able to. I've always been somebody who believed in the power of history. Even as a child, I really love reading biographies and understanding that basically history was about today, not just yesterday. I ended up working at the Air and Space Museum, but then left to go to teaching university. But at a certain point, I realized that what museums allowed me to do was have the biggest classroom ever. Getting the National African American Museum of History and Culture built and for it to be the beacon that it is, is without a doubt a hallmark of his career. He knew deep down that the African American story is the American story. It's an intrinsic part, it's not separate. And here you have someone who understands the power of history to actually unify us. I wanted the Smithsonian to be seen as a reservoir that people can dip into for understanding, for clarity, for hope. And so I think as a historian, I bring that to it, asking always, what's this mean? What is the connection? How do we contextualize this? What's the greater good? The learning never stops. It didn't end when he left graduate school. It didn't end in the first job. It doesn't end now. Um, he continues to learn he and continues to grow. Having Lonnie come forward and receive this award and become part of the William & Mary family 
is incredibly important to me because it's sort of pulling this thread of one of the nation's oldest colleges, linking it to one of the nation's most important oldest cultural institutions. It was a great match and I'm really excited to have this happening today. I'm humbled by it because I really think that honorary degrees are special, but I'm humbled because what I see an honorary degree as is less about me and more about recognizing the power of history, that it's important for a nation to candidly assess itself, to grapple with that history and to be made better by it. Lonnie Griffith, much the third, you have redefined the role of museums in this republic. You have served on the Committee for Preservation of the White House with bipartisan appointments from Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama. In 2005, you were named founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. The museum opened to international acclaim in 2016. Today it houses a collection of 40,000 objects. It is the first green building on the National Mall and ranks among the Smithsonian's most visited sites. In 2019, you became the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian. Through discovery and expansive storytelling, you positioned museums as catalysts for community engagement and civic growth. Lonnie Griffith Bunch, your patriotism in sharing the stories of our country's history and people is inspiring. The alma mater of the nation proudly honors you in our year of the arts. By virtue of the power vested in me by the Board of Visitors and the ancient royal charter of the College of William and Mary in Virginia, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa. What a joy it is to be with you today. I'm indebted to President Rowe, Chancellor Gates, Rector Postum, the Board of Visitors, and I'm so pleased to be with Jeff Trammell. Um, what a wonderful honor for him, and for me to be part of this with him means a lot to me. And it's also such an honor to receive this because this is a day about history, and I want to take a minute and talk a little bit about the power of history. But I'm also happy to be here because, candidly, I told my 96-year-old mother that I was coming down here to get an honorary degree, and she said to me, so you finally got into William & Mary. <laughs> As only a mother could do. But besides by making my mother happy, it's humbling and exciting to be with you because you're celebrating history. I have been so taken by the power and the impact of history and I've been so moved by how you at William and Mary are grappling with this. I spent a lot of time today at the Bray School, learning about it, listening, understanding the sort of unbelievably important history that is part of the Bray School. And then I learned about the Lincoln, uh, the Lemon Initiative, and went to the Hearth Memorial for the Enslaved, and learned about what you were doing in terms of understanding the Native American impact and story here. To me, it's essential to see that these actions are not seen as simple restorative justice or answer reactions that support the main story, but rather the embrace of history, the embrace of African American history, the embrace of Native American history is central to understanding who William and Mary is. It's, it's essential to understanding who we are as Americans. In essence, I would argue that what history reminds us is that regardless of whether your family was here for 250 years or got here 20 minutes ago, you are shaped by this story. At a time of extreme partisanship, we need to not fear our history, but we need to embrace the past, and we need to be made better by the knowledge that we have been shaped by this history. Think about it. 
we're now all comfortable saying we, our DNA has been shaped by, you know, our ancestors, our grandparents. That DNA shapes us. But there's also another kind of DNA. It's the history. It's our shared history. And that DNA has shaped who we are to this very day. I am really struck when I think about the importance of history by words by James Baldwin, the great author, who said, history does not refer merely or even principally to the past. We carry it with us. We are unconsciously controlled by it. History is literally present in all that we do. And I would argue that that is so right. And what I thought I'd do is take a minute and just talk quickly about why I think this history is so important, why it has such resonance for us today. I think one of the things that I'm always struck by is the challenge and the danger of forgetting. When I was a young curator at the Smithsonian, I was doing an exhibition, and I got a letter. Um, and the letter began, Dear Left-Wing Historian. So I knew it wasn't a fan letter. But the letter went on in a very serious way. They say, what happened to the Smithsonian I loved? It used to be a place that celebrated America, that told only positive stories. And now you're going to tell stories that are better left unsaid. I must admit, though, the letter threw me off because after criticizing and hoping that I got fired, the letter ended by saying, best wishes for your continued success. But I think what's important to me is that that letter was right. He's right because I think you can tell a great deal about a country by what it deems important enough to remember, by what monuments they build, by what graces the walls of museums, and what holidays you celebrate. But I would suggest to you, you learn even more about a nation by what it forgets, by what it wants to leave out, by what Nietzsche called creative forgetfulness. This desire to admit, to forget, is, is natural, but it's also instructive because often it's the story of those on the outside, people of color, women, who are left out of the narrative. And this was really brought home to me by a project I was doing early in my career on slavery. And I was traveling around the country looking at plantations, whether it was cotton plantations in Mississippi or tobacco plantations in North Carolina. And I came upon a rice plantation in South Carolina. And I went up this road, and there were four cabins that housed the enslaved built from the 1840s. And standing next to them was a man who was in his 90s then, Prince C. Jenkins. He had lived in one of these cabins with his enslaved grandmother. So basically, for a historian, this is the holy grail, to have somebody tell you these stories. And he told me about what happened in the cabin. And he went on and on. And then he said to me, you know, I'm not sure what a historian does, but maybe if you're a good historian, isn't your job to help people remember not just what they want to remember, but what they need to remember? And in many ways, that has profoundly shaped my career. In fact, it's a challenge for all of us to say it is important to revel in, to dig deeply into the history we love, but it's equally important to understand that history that challenges, that reminds us that we have a lot to do. For me, history is so important because it's also the power of inspiration. There is nothing in my mind more inspirational than, than American history, than African American history. And in fact, during the 11 years that it took to build the National Museum of African American History and Culture, what sustained me, what made me believe, were the stories and the peoples whose lives we cover. Think about it. Who could not be inspired by people who believed in an America that didn't believe in them? Who could not be inspired by people who could dream a world anew, who could imagine in a period of slavery could imagine freedom, could imagine fairness. How could you not be moved by people like an enslaved woman who got up every morning and fed her kids and loved her children before she went into the fields, and every night she came back determined not to let the fields strip her of her hope and of her humanity? Who could not be moved candidly by the students that went to the Bray School, who despite a desire to educate them to be comfortable with enslavement, they imagined a different future. When I look at history, I am so moved that I wish that candidly I was as strong as my enslaved ancestors. Because when we view the history of enslavement, 
we sometimes forget that while they were bought, they were also brave. And while they were sold, they were also strong. It is their resiliency and their suffering that inspired all who worked to build on the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Ultimately for me, when I think about the power of history and the power of memory, I realize that what history really is, it's a mirror to America. It's a reason to understand that history is so important and so vital because it's a mirror that challenges us clearly and candidly, reminds us that despite all of what we've achieved, despite all of our ideals, America is still a work in progress. It is a mirror that makes those who are invisible more visible. It is a mirror that gives voice to those who are silent. It's a mirror that says, let us live up to the founding ideals of this nation. Let us celebrate and revel, but let us also live up to those ideals. And to me, that notion of a mirror of, of history was really brought home by a dear friend of mine, Studs Terkel. Studs Terkel was the great oral historian who lived his life interviewing people to understand how people live their lives. When I knew Studs, he was in his 90s. And he once said to me, he said, Lonnie, I can't imitate him because he was so funny, but he said, Lonnie, I can't see too well, I can't hear a thing, I can't stand long, so here's what I want you to do. Make sure you point me in the direction where I can do good. And maybe that's the lesson of history, that you use the past to point us in the direction where we can all do good. That means helping a nation grapple with the complexity of its past helping a nation embrace the ambiguity, to recognize there are no simple answers to complex questions, but there is learning that comes from nuance, subtlety, and debate. History tells us that. In some ways, the amazing thing that history is, more than anything else, is it helps us define reality and still give hope. Yes, history is replete with stories of tragedy and injustice, of pain and exploitation, but it's also a story of resiliency and redemption, of high ideals, of an aspirational vision for America. History demands that we remember those who worked so hard, who died so young, who believed so hardly in a country, because we have to remember that we're standing on all their shoulders. Ultimately, when I think about what history is, it's really about our shared humanity. And let me end with one final story. I have one superstition. I never get on an airplane without shining my shoes. So I know every shoe shine man and woman in airports around the country. One day I was flying back from San Antonio and went and landed in Dallas. So I went to get my shoe shine. It was an elderly African American man. And he began to shine my shoes and he looked up and he said, are you that museum guy from Washington? I said, yeah. He didn't say anything else. He finishes shining my shoes, tell you how powerful museums are, right? But he shines my shoes and I give him $8. And he basically says, no, keep it for the museum. Now I gotta be honest, it was a shoe shine guy. So I said to him, look man, take this money. And he cut me off, he said, don't you be so disrespectful. Don't you know that if you do your job right, this museum might help my grandchildren understand what life did to me and what I did to life. To me, even though I never saw that man again, his words have hounded me in the best way. To realize that history could not only help this man and his family find understanding and hope, but it's equally important that his words reminded me that embracing our past as a nation, we get to see ourselves more clearly. And that history does challenge us to be better, to be more concrete in making our ideals closer. What history does more than anything else it challenges us to live up to Lincoln's desire for a more perfect union. Embracing the complicated past helps us realize that there is nothing more powerful than a people, than a nation steeped in its history, and there's nothing more noble than honoring all of our ancestors by remembering. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Bunch, Mr. Secretary, for those powerful and patriotic words. Uh, and thank you for all the ways that you have served and are serving and will serve our country. It's incredibly important work. So nearly three centuries ago, William and Mary pioneered the study of fine arts in the United States. That's right, William and Mary is believed to be the first university that taught the fine arts. Our country's founders believed that a broad education was the best preparation for citizenship in a new country. So in 1779, Reverend Robert Andrews became, quote, professor of moral philosophy, the laws of nature and of nations and of fine arts. Two ampersands, just saying. Uh, it, I think that faculty now should be able to write their own titles. They would be a lot more fun. This year we celebrate all of the creative human beings at this university, past, present, and future. For a university president who also happens to be a lifelong theater person, one of the best perks is attending student shows, so I'm just gonna give some plugs. Last December, I dropped in on three choral showcases in one afternoon. In a span of hours, I heard pop, classical, and carols, and it was glorious. There were parents there, there were classmates there, there were faculty and staff there. It was loud in the way that we love at William & Mary. And then improv was my next stop. Pink Tax, are you here? Oh, excellent. That's great. You know, they call us the cradle of coaches and comedians at William & Mary, cradle of comedians. You've heard that, right? Yes, yes. Uh, live performance in person, beautiful videos that people make for communities. Nothing is more powerful in teaching us about ourselves. This fall, we dedicated William & Mary's Arts Quarter alongside, along with this university's own royalty, Glenn Close. And for those of you who are not there, I want to capture a moment of that amazing dedication. She recalled arriving here at William & Mary for the first time, and she said, standing on the stage, she said, William & Mary was the water to my desert. Anyone who's ever attended a play or a gallery opening knows the feeling of being stretched and challenged and fulfilled that she talked about that evening. Participating in the arts is especially powerful when it's shared, when you can talk about, debrief, wrestle with the dynamic relationship that forms between artists and audience. It stretches you to listen and to see from different perspectives. It builds connection and fuels curiosity and lays the basis for common ground. It is essential to maturation as a wise human being and to growth, civic growth of a community. William & Mary is so fortunate to have support for the arts here from, from philanthropists, our alumni, and from the Commonwealth. So I want you all to know, and I want to give a shout out to the Commonwealth of Virginia for funding Phi Beta Kappa Hall and the music building to the tune of more than $138 million. That, that's not happening at states around the country. That's, that's an extraordinary thing to put the arts front and center and we are enormously grateful as well to the alumni and the faculty and the staff and families who gave back to our programs and then who come and be our audiences. I especially want to thank our Year of the Arts committee members. I hope that some of you are here. Would you please stand and wave? I know I can't see you because of light, but other people can see you. Yes, thank you. Earlier in the program, we welcomed new transfer students, and I was reflecting on the fact that you only had six months of the Year of the Arts, which is just wrong. So uh, today, I'm announcing that we're going to celebrate the Year of the Arts all the way to December 2024, which gives us multiple year-end showcases for us all to go to. Everyone in the arena, that's your homework. So it could be a workshop, it could be a performance, it could be a reading, it could be participatory. Whatever is your job, you need to be there. In that spirit, I'm pleased to introduce video greetings from several recognized student organizations. 
followed by a very special performance from William and Mary's Kleptomaniacs. my case. More live music. Uh, thank you, Kleptomaniacs331. That was fantastic. I want to do what somebody who spent much of my life in stage managing uh, when I was in high school and college does, which is to make sure that we thank the folks who are not on stage. So all our crew, our Charter Day committee members, and everyone who has worked behind the scenes to pull this program off, please stand and wave wherever you are. So we may thank you. And 
joins the William & Mary Wind Ensemble under the direction of Professor Richard Marcus. And the William & Mary Choir, directed by Professor Daniel Parks. So in a moment, the platform party will recess out. Audience, please remain in your seat until the recessional has concluded. Students should sign the Charter Day banner located in the mezzanine, and um, it will go into the archives. We need your signatures there 100 years from now. And cast your vote for the Royal Court. The results will be announced this evening at the Green and Gold Bash, hosted by AMP and the Student Assembly. Now, please stand as you're able and join us for the alma mater. Choir, take it away.